Hello and welcome to The Green Room at Furnitubes. I'm your host, Catherine Barrett, and we're here every month with a new episode. Join us for industry musings, interviews and discussions exploring all things landscape architecture, street furniture and urban design. Hello and welcome. I'm joined today by Martin Hunter, Senior Landscape Architect at Robert Bray Associates and an authority on nature-based suds. As part of our Decarbonise series focusing on sustainability and landscape architecture, Martin is here to talk about suds and the benefits of nature-based suds. Hi Martin, how are you? Hi there, thank you for having me. Welcome. So Martin, we're here today to talk about suds. Um, and I'm sure many of uh, many of our listeners or, or people listening to the podcast will know what uh, suds are. Um, but for those who don't, could you give us, uh, you know, a sentence for, for, for those not in the know of, of what SUDS are, please. The best kind of sentence to give you really is it's based on the SUDS manual. So there's a SUDS manual out there, which uh, lots of people like us, you know, use as a sort of a daily basis. They specify SUDS as sustainable drainage or SUDS is a way of managing rainfall that minimises the negative impacts of the quantity and quality of runoff whilst maximising the benefits of amenity and biodiversity for people and the environment. Sounds a bit woolly, but I'm sure it will come clear as we go through, you know, what those mean, you know, the things we're trying to reduce, trying to mitigate, and the things we're trying to promote through water sensors design. So then what so what are SUDs trying to mitigate? What's what are they trying to do? Obviously it focuses on water. So you imagine many of the sort of conversations around water and the problems with water, it's based on two main things. It's flooding and pollution. Those are the two things you hear in the news regularly. So flooding, taking flooding for example. There's plenty of examples across the country and in the world where flooding has been an issue and it will continue to be an issue, if not worse, in the future of climate change. And the problem with that, we've broken down the natural cycle of, of water and especially in our cities and towns where we have huge amounts of hard landscape, a very outdated drainage system in most instances, especially in, in London. And as new developments grow, we're building upon that and, and building upon those weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, and this is where we're starting to see more and more of the problems come to light. So, you know, uh, flooding, for example, is in Cornwall, all kinds of places across the country. And SUDS is trying to mitigate that, SUDS is trying to slow the flow. It's trying to bring the water back to the surface, trying to attenuate surface water in the landscape so that it slows how much water goes to the rivers and, and to the streams. And so it hopefully reduces the amount of flooding that happens in our towns and cities. Pollution is the ever beast of traditional drainage systems. You know, most of our surface water in our own environment goes into sort of traditional drainage systems that go into a sewer. Most of the time, they are combined with our foul network. So it means that we are beautifully clean, useful water is, is going straight into our mixing with effluent, essentially. And so there's some circumstances where it is kept separately, but more often than not, especially in London, it's such an old system that all that really useful resource, the water, fresh water, is going straight into our foul system. And this is where you see some of these issues we see on the news. You know, for example, with 2020 was well documented to be one of the worst. 400,000 times raw sewage went into our rivers and seas and our streams. And that's partly because we've got so much water going to those water treatment plants. It can't cope with it. It's such an old system, it doesn't cope. And so studs again can help with that because it slows that flow down to those water treatment plants. It kind of deals with the surface water at the surface, doesn't put it into pipes, doesn't put it into the sewer system. So it dramatically reduces how much water goes into that system. So it only has to deal with things like foul water and, and, and effluent, you know, trying to protect the rivers and, and the seas and, and cleaning that water. So those are two main things we're trying to mitigate, really. Martin, can you give me some examples of good, um, I guess, good versus bad suds or when you, what you've seen? I'm sure you've seen a wide range. Yeah, of, of course. And, and again, if we're, if we're comparing nature-based suds versus engineered suds, you know, I think even though we talked about um, underground tanks previously, Something we see quite often, which is, you know, really it does stand out to be one of the worst examples of engineered suds that we see time and time again. And that is what we call a pipe to pond system. So right. essentially you hear them being called balancing ponds and they're quite common on sort of housing developments and so on, where essentially the surface water is captured by traditional drainage gullies, sent through pipes into a, a steep sided basin, which can be sort of three to four meters deep. They're pretty ugly things. They stick up like a sore thumb with protective fencing around them and the water, because they don't really do anything in terms of improving the water quality, it's taking the surface runoff straight into these gullies, straight into the pipe, straight into the pond. The water typically is oily, 
it's polluted. They're not very nice. Covered in you know vibrant green algae. No swimming you know, in you know, that free pond. Fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's just kind of a bit of a scene out of, uh, you know, Simpsons or something, I'm sure. But they have very little source control. And so there's the assumption that you put water into a basin and it'll make a pond and then things will just thrive. And it's just not true. It just doesn't work like that. You know, you need to manage pollution, which is in that water, to allow things to thrive and get the full use out of it. So that's something we see time and time again. And in fact, I've been involved before I joined RBA. I got involved with a couple of schemes. And even then, before I knew really what SUDS was, I realised this is not a good thing. This didn't feel appropriate didn't feel acceptable and so it kind of really made me go oh god you know this is what we do with, with water we're, you know when we try and make suds you know it seems like a such a wrong thing to do so yeah we see that time and time again and it's not it's not a great thing to see because they're still relying on gullies to get maintenance issues left right and center so gully will block up have leaves block up it's very intensive amount of water goes into one small area and so you know when it fails it, it blocks up and that's it no more water goes in and you see it on the side of roads all the time don't you, you see yeah. someone rotting the the, the gully because it's blocked up and the whole road's kind of covered in water and so when it needs maintenance you don't realize how bad it's got until it's already broken and then it's an emergency to get those sort of things sorted and there, if you imagine on the other side of that nature base suds everything's either a swale it's all indentations in the ground essentially so you can see when it's just starting to fill up in the wrong places or maybe a bit of a bunding is kind of falling down a bit. so it's very easy to maintain very easy to see when it's kind of not doing the job it should do. And, and it doesn't fail instantly. You can right, come in time. years off, you know. And so you've got plenty of time. Next time you're out on site, you can go, well, I'll just fix it up. You know, and it can be done by anybody. It doesn't need particularly heavy trained people to go. It doesn't need engineers to go out. It can be Joe Bloggs. I think you can go and do it if he knows, if he gets a small bit of training of going, you just need to build that bund up. You need to clear that vegetation away. That's it. It's all really simple stuff. Yeah, so a good example, if you're going to kind of compare that kind of example to a, a good example of nature-based, some of the experience in mind is a, is a project I'm working on down in Brighton at the moment where we are trying to improve the quality of water going to the aquifer. So the aquifer down in Brighton is quite important. It's where a lot of their drinking water comes from. Um, and it's trying to improve the quality. So at the moment we have a scheme where a number of roads, surface runoff comes into traditional drainage gullies, goes into sort of like a balancing pond, and then it goes straight into some soak away, straight into the aquifer, which is not the best. They recognise there's improvements being made. And so what we're doing is looking at balance and ponds, saying, okay, what can we do to make it better? So that's you know, nature based up. So we're looking at improving engineering now, but improving water that comes into it. So treating that straight away before it gets in. We are putting uh, floating pontoons full of vegetation, which will go up and down as the water you know, raises in sinks. All the root system will kind of filter that water. So it's really doing some really good stuff there. It will then get taken all the way down to a park down the road. And we are via some conveyance, so swales, we're taking that in from through a swale, which again provides cleaning into a series of basins. Now we have, uh, I think we have four or five basins in the scheme. The first two are lined. So what that means is that the water goes into these, these systems. They're not allowed to infiltrate because we still don't think they're good enough quality to go into the ground. ground yeah. yeah. So we have these lovely, you know, basins full of very diverse planting. It's already significantly clean. So the planting will survive or thrive. While well, cleaning that, it will go into the next system, the next system, and by the time it gets to the bottom, the lower basin, you know, it's infiltrating. So that water is disappearing straight into the ground. It's not a problem anymore. But you think of all the benefits that brings. So, you know, for the local schools, get involved with sort of, you know, looking at what's happening, inspecting under rocks and seeing animals and, you know, invertebrates under the rocks and stuff. And you know, in terms of the plants, the actual the carbon sink that produces, you know, all this new vegetation. What well, at the moment is a, it's just a big playing field. We have all this really diverse, rich planting typologies in there, and it provides a big carbon sink for, for the scheme. So you can see very differently how you know one is preferable and how one is not. You know, amazing. Uh, and definitely, nature based judges, you know, you get people involved with it much more as well. You know, it, there's no fencing around it because the water quality is fine. There's no steep sides. We try and design them so they have these kind of benches within them, which is the term we use for sort of little plateaus. So it's very safe to use. So as you walk down, if you want to walk into the water, you'll walk into a really thin It's not a sudden drop, yeah. Deeper. Absolutely, yeah, which you get with the balancing ponds, the pipe to pond approach. So, you know, it's trying to make it a useful resource for amenity value for people to use and, and enjoy. So it's, it's going to be a really good project when it gets on the ground. Yeah, that's, that it makes it, it makes it, well, it makes it very clear to me. And what, so what would you say is the current state of, of SUDS in the UK at the moment? Well, if you go back to the fourth pillars, Realistically, probably 95 
percent, if not more, if I'm honest, probably 97 percent of SUDS projects, inverted commas, you know, are still going down the engineered route, which is a bit of a problem. You know, we're missing out on all these extra benefits which we could put into our schemes by having the wrong approach, essentially. The founding director, Bob Ray, he did a lot of research and he started the company mid 90s, you know, and took a lot of inspiration from places like in America, for example, place in Oregon, Portland is kind of the key place for where they started. And they didn't call it subs back then. Obviously, it was just something they did. And they do things like taking roof runoff and put it into their main gardens and front of their lawns. They take roadside runoff and put it into sort of swales and, and stuff like that. So it was kind of seen as, as a resource to look after. So you're, you're watering your plants, you're irrigating your plants and taking some of that polluted water off the roads. And when Bob first started the company 20 odd years ago, I'm sure he imagined that it would have got a lot further by now. I'm assuming he probably thought that it would be an upward trajectory in terms of how much nature better subs would be important in nowadays work, but it still isn't. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, that approach of suds of being nature based and using natural aspects of our world to manage rainfall and surface water has been taken up by sort of an engineered solution. So I'm guessing that's probably because drainage engineers, by their very name, look at drainage and so people just assume that that's an engineer's job. But that means that we're just missing out on all these extra benefits that SUDS could bring. It's not great, I must admit. It's not great at the moment. We are seeing more and more, especially when climate change is getting more and more in front of the news pages in terms of, you know, what clients want to see now and want to see start tackling, but we're still a long way to go. Is scaling um, nature-based SUDS difficult or is it as easy, as straightforward as engineered SUDS? No, it's it, it not in so many ways, it's easier, it's easier. You know, in terms of installing it, in yeah. terms of maintaining it. And you know what? This is what really blows our mind. It's much cheaper. cheaper. Wow. <laughs> it's much, much cheaper. Yeah. We just don't understand how it's still engineered. I think landscape architects, I think, still as, as a profession, is still probably seen not as important on building projects. Right. You know, we're not seen as people who are really bringing something new. We're seen as, as the people who just do the fluffy stuff around the edges. It's the building, it's the engineers who are involved up at the front. And I think... That's a real shame because they're missing a lot of benefits which we can bring. And we all know how important outdoor spaces are for people, but it's just still not seen in that way. And so I think that's maybe where some of the difficulties are, is that they still see us as people who just provide green stuff. Right, right. Not actually a solution that brings benefits on top of the, the landscape. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It'd be great to, to hear more about you know, what, what nature-based suds are, how how they're helping to combat climate change um, and what's so, you know, what's challenging about the more widely used um, engineered SUDs? The nature-based SUDs, by its very name, and, and, and nature is, is using natural systems and, and allowing rainfall to do what it's meant to do and fall into the ground and stay at the surface. I think that's what nature-based does. It keeps water at the surface, it allows a lot of natural processes to take place. When we think of climate change, for example, you know, all the things which are going to change in the UK, particularly and alongside the world, we think of our climate getting warmer. We're going to have more and more erratic rainfall periods, yeah. heavier rainfall Heavier periods, rainfall, yeah. Absolutely. And more frequent drought, so more extreme weather. Wildlife is going to be affected, not just, you know, in the air, on the ground, it's going to be in the seas and, and the water as well. And our vegetation and plants and trees will have to also adapt to make sure they still survive in a, in a, in a, a warming climate. So... When you think of those examples of what's going to happen for us in the next, well, what's happening now, and then obviously in our future, nature-based suds is looking at providing vegetative kind of approaches to managing rainfall, which pretty much tackles all those things. So, you know, let's have, for example, putting planting in generally, you know, depaving, for example, you know, you're, you're increasing the amount of vegetation, you're increasing the amount of typologies of vegetation. We're not just using grass. We try and use a whole range of things, shrubs, perennials, trees, you know, all these sorts of things, different layers of vegetation. And that provides a carbon sink. You know, that's always helping. That's always taking carbon out of the air, producing oxygen. That's always a good thing. And things like wetlands are brilliant for this. You know, so again, this is where suds comes in. We can manage erratic rainfalls by attenuating and, and slowing the flow of water back into our water system, rivers and streams. So we can manage that better. Obviously, that protects us from sort of local flooding and regional flooding. We can clean up our waters. So nature-based suds is really good at cleaning surface water. And so keeping that surface water clean when it goes into our rivers and streams, it's protecting the ecology and the the, the ecosystems of those systems. You know, we're increasing tree covers. 
all these things are actually really helping with, with cooling our planet. You know, and even if you actually just remind me there of blue green roofs, you know, for example, you know, something which is getting more and more popular, but that helps cool buildings in the summer and warm buildings in the, in the winter. So all these things are really good ways of tackling climate change, both the effects of it, but also mitigating and trying to slow it down. Just on the flip side then, so if you look at engineered floods, go back to your original question, if the main goal is really to only attenuate water, it doesn't have all these extra benefits. It doesn't have these benefits of what nature-based subs has. One of the very classic examples of a, an engineered sub system is a attenuation tank, which is put under the ground. So these are big plastic carbon creating units that go in the ground. They're huge things. They need huge machinery to put them in. They're expensive to install. They're expensive to maintain. They're intensive. They have to move large areas of soil to make it work, which obviously, again, that's, if it's in London, for example, chances are have to go to the countryside to get rid of it. So they really are not very good in terms of mitigating climate change. They're only attenuating water, which you know is only managing the resultant problem. It's not tackling climate change. It's just trying to manage the issues of climate change. But also, arguably, they're making it worse because you're putting plastic tanks on the ground even doesn't sound right, does it? No. Alone no. being no. right. So that's the problem. And again, you know, when you compare the two, if we need to make quick action now, if we need to start really turning things around in terms of what our landscapes are doing. They need to be cost effective. And again, this is where I just don't understand why landscape sort of nature based suds isn't promoted more because it is considerably cheaper than engineered suds. You know, a recent example of ours, we worked on a project in Hackney and they were looking at putting underground storage tanks. And we proposed blue green roofs, which I mentioned before. And overall, they, they realized very quickly that this is going to be a huge cost saving to them. Wow. And so they put blue green roofs in all the buildings, not just a few of them. And they still saved eight hundred thousand pounds. Oh, you know, so almost a million pounds. That's fantastic. Just, just doing this, and you think, so why is it still being a challenge? You know? Right. <laughs> so um, right. it's a difficult one, you know. And even cost comparison on, on general suds, nature-based suds, comes to compared to even traditional suds in terms of the gully systems and the pipe system, you're still saving about fifteen percent on anything you do. So we can always offer a cost saving to clients and it's more and it's better and it's more beautiful yeah. <laughs> absolutely and it's greener yeah. and it's it has greener, benefits of yeah. wildlife and everything it's a difficult one I think hands down nature based suds has a huge chance to really turn things around in terms of combating climate change but again it comes down to councils it comes down to legal flood authorities it comes down to even private clients wanting to do it and recognising that there's a value to it and I think that's the more we can talk about it, the better it is. And these sort of podcasts and stuff 100% are great. Hundred percent agree. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hundred percent agree. Yes, yes. Now you've mentioned green blue roofs. What other types of what are what are other examples of nature based suds in terms of sort of the uh, the implementation or the, the way that nature based suds can be introduced to a scheme? Um, we we call it a, a management train. So we have different systems and different things called conveyances. So where water gets made to be, uh, we have. That management train can be made up of a series of features with uh, conveyance in between them, uh, a source control right at the beginning, which, which makes up the whole system. So um, we can't expect our water when we capture it from the roof or the road to be clean and beautiful and lovely to use elsewhere. We, we've got to do something with that. So um, so conveyance, yeah, that's starting, especially moving water from one place to the next or one right. system to the next system. Um, but realistically, right at the beginning, we need to do source control. So source control is managing what we do with any pollutants in that water. So let's for argument say you say a roof, um, chances are if it's a tiled roof, there's not going to be many pollutants on that. Um, you, in the cities, you might get a little bit more because obviously there's pollutants in the air and it settles on the roofs and stuff, but it's minimal. So realistically, your first conveyance is probably taking that from the, the downpipe uh, through a channel into the next system. So it's, you don't need much source control. When you compare that to a road, which has a lot of pollutants on it, has a lot of bits of tyre, has hydrocarbons, lots and lots of sort of pollutants which stay on the surface. And there's this term called first flush, which is essentially when all that kind of pollutants sit on the road, the first time it rains, the first 10, 15 mil of rain comes down, oh, picks it all up super dirty, straight yeah. into the system. So normally, you know, what that would do is go straight into our gullies and straight into our sewer system and cause issues down the line. But what we do maybe in a, in a nature-based solution, so... This is where it gets a bit complicated because we don't always use vegetation for these treatments. You know, we use things like thermal paving, which are really useful tool in urban environments. So that provides a source control. So that's so the basic block paving with sort of grit joints. And as the water falls on that, 
picks up all those pollutants, it gets kind of first filtered through the grit layer before it goes out and either it's attenuated within that pebble paving subbase or it's taken out to the surface again elsewhere. So we have to do source control. That's the first step of the whole management tray. Once we get past that bit, once we kind of go, okay, we've managed that initial source of pollution, doesn't mean that water is clean. So again, let's take the worst case scenario. Let's take a you know, really busy road. We've done maybe a bit of permal paving, which is great. That's taken some of the heavier materials out. We then take it back to the surface. So it's always good to put it on the surface. You have some of the extra benefits of that. But you might go through a swale, the vegetated swale, which again cleans that water, goes through a series of basins, maybe. There's a whole range of things. So I'm just trying to think of conveyance now. So we've got swales, overhead channels are quite interesting. So ones where you take roof runoff above your head and oh, it wow. can be quite artistic elements. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to, because obviously there's too much of a, a footway or something you need to kind of bridge. But yeah, it can be really interesting features. And then when you get into things like blue green roofs are a good example of suds features we have. And obviously that'd be the start of it. That'd be all resource control as well. But rain gardens, we've got permal paving, like I say, rain guard, rain planters. You see at the bottom of rain pipes coming from buildings. We have basins. Most of them are kind of quite natural led, so most of them are more depressions in the ground or built up and so on. So it's make it as minimalistic as possible to get the most benefit out of it, reducing obviously carbon going into it. So all these attenuate water quantity, doing one of the pillars there, it's doing water quantity. It's cleaning that water. So every system it goes through, it cleans that water through use of vegetation, allowing a lot of natural losses to happen. So things like infiltration, transpiration for trees, so they're sucking up all that water. So actually, once you take into account natural losses, by keeping the surface, the water at the surface, as opposed to in the ground as engineers do, you're allowing things like infiltration to happen, you're allowing for vegetation to clean it, you're allowing plants and trees to suck up that water as much as they can. And so the actual amount of water you start with in a rainfall event will probably diminish by the time you get to the end of our management train compared to an engineered solution where it goes into a tank. Yeah. And, it's, and it's exciting to design with as well. You know, when you think about having how you can get water to run through our landscapes, it's, it's a dynamic thing you're doing. So every time it rains, you've got these big pools of water doing things. And it's actually a really exciting challenge to right. have there to try and engage our users, our end users, with the water and the natural process of water. And water's doing its job. It, water's kind of working as well as everything else in the landscape. It's doing what it's meant to do. Yeah, not being kind of stuck away in a tank. <laughs> Absolutely. It's trying to get back to that natural water system, which I think we are almost scared of at the moment. I think people are so scared of flooding and, and right. you know, and you hear these awful things about people drowning in really very small ponds and stuff like that. And, and I think people are so scared of using water, but actually it's such an important resource for our landscapes. and. If we're going to try and really tackle climate change, I think these are the sort of things we need to start doing more of. You know? So, yeah, so those are the sort of things we can do. So, conveyance features to our main structures, you know, main features. And then, usually by that point, the water would be nice and clean, drinkable water. We either allow it to infiltrate, so we allow it at certain points, we do allow it once we know it's clean, we'll allow it to go back into, into the ground or overflow into a nearby river or stream. You know, we put flow controls on these things, so it slows how much water gets there. But yeah, it's a very natural system when you look at them. You know, even the description, it, it, it makes far more sense. And you've talked about um, uh, Portland and Oregon as, a, as kind of the, the founding home almost, or the accidental home um, of, of nature-based suds. Are there, are there other countries or states, in, in, you know, areas that... that do nature-based suds particularly well? Portland's pretty good, yeah. I think that was the, the sort of pioneer, whether they realised that or not at the time. They were pioneering something, something new and something great. Um, you know, there's lots of work in Australia, New Zealand, USA, Europe, generally Sweden, Holland as well, very good. So there's some really good examples across the world, and it's, it's quite easy just typing in suds and, and, and it will nature-based suds and just typing in the country. Chances are you'll get the top five, you know, <laughs> projects. And um you know, I remember being in New Zealand actually before I joined Robert Bray Associates about four years ago. And there's a scheme, which I'm probably going to butcher the name of this now, but there's a beautiful scheme down in, in, in Wellington on the coast. And it's called Tianga Park, I think it's called. And they have this right in the public square. So they have a sort of skate park there. They have a cafe and so on. It's right next to the museum on the, on the waterfront. And they have a stormwater treatment plant, which sounds like, oh, you don't want that anywhere near... Sounds industrial, but no. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but it's all there. And you can see how the water goes through each of these systems and it's obviously getting filtered and filtered as it goes through. Fantastic. You know, that's, that's what I want to see more of. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see and you're, as you're walking through this public square, you're surrounded by really tall planting, which 
quite a big city, but it's not, you know, you've still got a beautiful landscape and a beautiful scenery behind it. But it's so nice to be close to nature and having these really big planting features right next to you as you're walking through it. So, yeah, that was a really good one. And also understanding how it's kind of knowing where your food comes from. It's knowing how your water works, knowing where your water comes from, rather than it being hidden away and it just comes out of a tap. You actually can see <laughs> see how it's see how it's being treated. And um, well, tell me about what about the UK? So that there, I know you guys have worked on some fantastic schemes. Are there any particular schemes in the UK that you feel highlight? You know, the, the best way to implement nature based suds. I agree. We have done some great schemes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even before I joined RBA, you know, I, I really, yeah, they, they've got some great schemes uh, tucked in the belt and I'm working on some great schemes going forward. I'm really you know, privileged to be working alongside some of the, you know, Bob Bray and, and Kevin Barton on some of the projects we're working on. And, you know, some of the projects they have worked on in the past, things like uh, the Great Green Project in Sheffield. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. You know, we were part of that in the early stages, providing advice on how it's going to work. And that's a, that's probably, probably one of the better well-known projects in the UK. You know, Sheffield is a bit of a heart for sort of green innovations and like I say the university is fantastic. And so Greater Green is kind of indicating a, a great way of using suds in the streets, both making public realm improvements, but also obviously managing surface runoff. So that's a great scheme. One of our best projects uh, for RBA is probably Australia Road in London, Bridget Joyce Square. A fantastic project, won plenty of awards for that. And it's more of a community space. You know, there's a big sort of rain garden in the centre and permeable paving around it. So it's a multi-use space, but has this real green heart to it. And it's, it's a fantastic project. It works beautifully in terms of its suds capabilities. And yeah, it's got a lot of community input into that project as well in terms of maintenance and so on. So that's a great one. What Hart Lane in London is another good scheme we've done, which is a sort of a roadside scheme with bioretention rain gardens. So that's taking surface runoff from the roads and cleaning that and, and managing that. I think it's probably more interest now coming into like places like Cardiff. We've got a project in Swansea and, and Dublin. There's a lot of good examples outside of our great work. You know, there's a lot of good examples in London generally. That like places like Enfield, Hounslow, Fulham Mill have some great projects there which have been done outside of our work. And they're a great project. I can't even think of the name of one now, but there's some really good projects there. <laughs> Right, as part of our podcast series, we ask everyone who comes on three quick fire questions. Um, so first of all, what made you want to become a landscape architect? Growing up, I was always very interested in nature. My grandfather and grandparents lived on the farm, so I spent a lot of time in the fields, in the orchards, you know, and I really enjoyed being out in nature. And I think it was that kind of led me down the sort of natural side of things. And at school, I did a lot of design and technology, which was essentially you know, having a, a problem to solve and, and doing it through design and then obviously building it afterwards. And so when we got to my A-levels, I did sort of physics and design technology and geography and all those things in biology as well. And all those things started to come together a little bit. And funny enough, my mum, when we were like, trying to look at where to go for university, my mum actually found landscape architecture as a career wow. uh, and somewhere to go. And, and so it was only until then she sort of said, oh, this is a thing. This is actually you know, designing landscape. This is the actual thing. It's not gardening it's everything you know and so yeah it kind of started from there really so that's when I actually realized that that's the career I wanted to go through and I remember being at the time I was working in a sort of an aquarium shop and this is this thing I put in all my CVs and all my sort of cover letters and stuff because working in an aquarium shop I used to sort of manage all the tanks and the aquariums and try and sell the fish obviously that's the whole point of it but making sure the water quality is good making sure the tanks are looking great and clean suitable for the fish they're holding and I suppose did that when I was a teenager and it kind of felt natural to then go well just scale it up yeah looking after the natural world yeah exactly and so um yeah it just kind of fell into place to be honest my mum said oh, do you know landscape architecture is like oh that sound good yeah I'll go how that. brilliant <laughs> at that age to have everything that you enjoy doing come together and know that that's a career that you could follow it's brilliant absolutely yeah it's really good I went to Sheffield and Sheffield's a great university for that as well you yeah know, it's a really good leading lectures there and so that obviously just kept me going on this path of where I am now. So what is one thing that landscape architects and the landscape architecture profession can do to combat climate disaster? I know that's a really big question. <laughs> yeah, it is a difficult one. I think, you know, as landscape architects, we're very well placed for getting hands on with climate change and, and making our landscapes more resilient. You know? And obviously that's what we need for the future. I mean, climate change is going to change so many things of our climate in the UK. You know, as well as the whole world, that we need people to be able to design resilience into our landscapes to survive and, and continue to thrive. 
You know, if you think of a landscape market and what we do, let's take a classic example of a scheme that city centre. We would bring in trees, which would then help with cooling of our streets. We look at bringing in suds, yeah. which we bring yes. in, you know, so bringing in water sense to design into our streets. We look at depaving a lot of times, trying to depave. So again, you, you kind of increase the amount of vegetation and vegetation typology into our landscapes. And so all these things are really actually good climate combating things we can do. So we're, we're very well placed for doing it. The problem, I guess, with what's the one thing most architects can do is it's really not down to us most of the time. You know, we work for clients, we're professionals. And so even though, you know, we really must give our clients the best advice, current advice about how to improve their ambitions for a site. So, you know, whether it's saying we can do a more sustainable approach this way or we can incorporate biodiversity this way, at the end of the day, it comes down to client ambition, client budget, client views. You know, some people still were on this view that climate change isn't going to be an issue for us. And, you know, so many of us do know that is going to be an issue and we need to start tackling it now. So it's hard to say what one thing we could do because so much of it's out of our hands. But I probably the, the, the main suggestion I would have for most kinds of architects is specification, you know, looking at specification, making sure that your products, your materials you're providing are locally sourced if you can looking at sort of reducing carbon footprint. So, you know, you don't want stuff from China and Vietnam. You can get it from the UK, let's get it from the UK. You know, looking at sustainable trademarks, for example, FSC Timber. You know, I always specify FSC Timber on all my wood products because there's no reason not to anymore. You know, we really should be doing this as standard. So really looking at our schemes, looking at our specification, trying to limit how much hard paving goes in and hard landscape goes in and seeing where we can cut down on body carbon. I think that's the only suggestion I can do because that's something we can you do. Can't you know, we can get a, yeah. Exactly. You know, we, we get a you know, we get a brief through and there's so many ways to do that, but if we go, okay, let's limit the amount of carbon going into the scheme, that's something we can do and still achieve the ambitions of the client. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Um, and finally, if you could put a bench anywhere in the world, um, where would you put it and why? I'm assuming I can just click my fingers and yeah, be transported yeah. there instantly. Anywhere, yeah, anywhere you okay. want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny, I spent a lot of my youth kind of, uh, well, adulthood as well, doing a lot of traveling in, in Britain. I love Britain, you know, I love Scotland, Ireland, you know, down in Kent, all those places, Cornwall, Griffin, in Cornwall. And so I love Britain. And I think so it has to be in Britain somewhere. I'd love to say it would be in New Zealand or something like that, but Britain's where it's at for me. And as much as I'd like to say it would be somewhere like Wisman Woods, for example, down in, in Devon, there's a beautiful woodland there. You can kind of you can imagine just sitting on a bench there, looking at all the, all the trees covered in lichen. They're kind of, all kind of very contorted trees. It's a beautiful, beautiful landscape. But I also wouldn't want to ruin it. So it would have to be somewhere like, I guess, a Scottish Isle somewhere, probably. It would be Isle of Iona off Mull would be great. You know, beautiful, beautiful landscape and beautiful blue skis. And yeah, I think that would be, if I could just kick my fingers, that's where I'd be. That would be lovely. And that feeling of being right. I mean, that, that farthest, far, you know, that far feeling that you're at the far point um, is a really great feeling there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much um, for coming in and talk to us, uh, Martin. It's been uh, brilliant, and I think it's really important that we keep talking about, as you say, nature-based suds and making sure that people are aware of them and, and the benefits of them. Uh, so, thank you for coming in and explaining more about them and, and the benefits. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. Mm-hmm.